Okay, everyone, I think that we're ready to get started. Uh, so welcome everybody to our first seminar of the semester. Uh, as usual, uh, we will start with a land acknowledgement. So we respectfully acknowledge the territory in which we gather as the ancestral homelands of Beothuk and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of Mi'kmaq and Beothuk. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nunatsiavut and Nunatukavut and the Innu of Nusinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. We strive for respectful relationships with all the peoples of this province as we search for collective healing and true reconciliation and honor this beautiful land together. So very happy uh, to welcome everyone to the first uh, seminar of the semester, like I said. And uh, uh, Dr. Martine Lazat, you can start whenever uh, you're ready. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I'm super happy uh, to be the first to kick off this uh, webinar series in 2021. And today I want to talk to you about dimethyl sulfide, DMS for short. And I want to put it into a climate change perspective. And I'm going to explain my title a little later on, what I mean by hot and sour. And this graph that you see here, uh, it's a very simple schematics of some of the processes involved in DMS cycling. And as we go along, I'll uh, bring back this graphic and it's, it will get a little bit more complex, but I'll keep it simple still. Um, before I start, I delve into this. Um, I want to, um, let me see if I can change the, oops, I changed the, the slide here. There we go. Uh, I want to acknowledge that this work is really a collective effort of many, many people, uh, uh, mainly um, the lab of Maurice Levasseur in Laval University and all the students and the postdoc who participated in gathering the data and analyzing the data and, and uh, producing papers. And I also want to acknowledge the many, several colleagues and teammates from different entities NetCare, ArcticNet, Sentinel North, Amunds and Science, uh, Takuvik, Quebec Océan, uh, partners from DFO, and members of the SOLAS uh, team. All right, so um, I decided to break this talk into 12 sections, and I could have added a lot of points to each of these subsections, but um, in the interest of keeping it short and keeping your attention, uh, I, I stuck to three uh, points for each of these sections. And we're gonna start by looking into the three reasons why we should all care about dimethyl sulfide, DMS, uh, reasons why we should care about its production in the Arctic specifically, and three potential impacts of climate change on DMS. There are several, but again, we'll stick to three. And three ways forward, uh, where we should we focus our attention uh, in the future? All right, so let's start by looking into uh, the first reason why we should all be interested in DMS. Um, it plays an important role in our planet's albedo. And I'll start by um, giving you an, an overview of some of the processes uh, involved in DMS cycling. The story starts with uh, a compound called dimethyl sulfonyopropionate, but we're gonna call it DMSP from now on, it's just easier. Um, DMSP is produced by algae in the oceans, phytoplankton, and um, it, uh, it is a precursor of DMS. So DMS has a biogenic origin. DMS is a volatile, it's a gas, so it, it easily ventilates into the atmosphere. And the oxidation products of DMS in the atmosphere, uh, sulfuric acid and sulfates, um, act to um, uh, backscatter heat radiation in two ways. The first one is that uh, following this uh, gas to particle conversion of DMS into you know, uh, oxidation products like sulfates, um, there can, uh, these particles act uh, to backscatter uh, incoming solar radiation directly. But these particles of sulfate can also uh, act as cloud condensation nuclei and aid in the formation of clouds that then will backscatter, backscatter solar radiation. So in a sense, atmospheric sulfur, most of which comes from the sea as DMS, is a type of check against global warming. So that's the first reason we should all uh, be interested in DMS. 
Um, and to that effect, um, here's a graph showing global and annual mean radiative forcing from pre-industrial to present about 2000, the year 2000. On the x-axis, you see the radiative forcing expressed in watts per meter squared. On the x-axis is the level of scientific understanding of the different agents that participate in radiative forcing from high uh, level of understanding, medium, low to very low uh, understanding, um, scientific understanding. So the boxes, the rectangles denote the or best estimate value of these different agents and their impact on radiative forcing. And the lines, um, these lines here, they denote the uncertainty related to, um, to our best estimate values. Now, in terms of these long lived greenhouse gases, including halocarbons and nitrous oxide and methane and CO2, we see that uh, our level of, of uh, understanding is, is relatively good. The uncertainty is, is relatively low, but then um, different agents participating in radiative forcing have um, higher uncertainty. And I won't go through all of these different agents. I, wanna, uh, uh, I want to focus on this uh, uh, particular one, which doesn't have a rectangular box, which means that we don't have best estimates um, as of today. Um, this agent is the tropospheric aerosol indirect effect, and it directly relates to the indirect effect of DMS emissions I was talking about, the um, uh, capacity of uh, aer sulfate aerosols coming from the oxidation of DMS to act as cloud condensation nuclei, and then uh, the formation, aiding in the formation of clouds and increasing the albedo of our planet through the formation of, of white uh, and highly reflective clouds uh, that reflect the incoming heat radiation. And so uh, this graphic is from uh, the, the AR6 uh, IPCC report. And so it, sh it shows that we've got a lot to learn still about um, this type of indirect effect. There's a lot of uncertainty from, you know, it could be no effect. This agent could have no effect on radiative forcing or it could have a significant effect. If you look, if you compare this, uh, the length of this line to the length of this, uh, this uh, stacked, um, those stacked boxes. And so having a better grasp on that portion of the budget uh, would um, significantly aid in our understanding of radiative forcing and how um, uh, ongoing and, and future climate change will impact this. Now, a second reason why um, it, it's interesting to, uh, to study DMS is that um, emission of DMS provides a route of sulfur transport from the marine environment to the terrestrial environment via the atmosphere. And so um, uh, the return of this um, uh, of the sulfur would uh, come from wet deposition from, from uh, the rain in the clouds. And so DMS is a key uh, intermediate in global sulfur cycling. So if you wanna model sulfur cycling, um, you have to take into account DMS as an important key intermediate in that, in that sulfur cycle. Um, this table shows you um, estimates of natural emissions of organosulfur compounds. So uh, we're not looking here into other sources of, of sulfur like volcanoes, but really what's produced by biogenically. Um, so it's from different sources, ocean, salt marshes, freshwater swamps, soils and plants. And you see the total there at the bottom. And I, I, I focus here on, uh, well, there's different uh, compounds released here in teragrams of sulfur per year. There's uh, DMS, uh, carbonyl sulfide, dimethyl disulfide and uh, carbon, uh, carbon disulfide. And I focused here on DMS in the oceans because basically that is the most important source of sulfur to the atmosphere. It's, it literally um, composes almost uh, the total of um, these, these emissions, 80% um, in fact. Right, the, the third reason why um, we should all be interested in DMS is because DMS smells. So the smell of the sea is caused by a cocktail of, of compounds, of chemicals, and like any other perfume, um, it, it, it has 
several several compounds in there. But the keynote, the 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 characteristic smell uh, from the seaside comes from DMS and. Um, most people can smell con DMSA concentrations as low as 0 0.02 parts per million. So we're in the nanomolar level here. Uh, so beyond the, you know, kind of fun uh, idea that DMS smells, it actually has an important role in um, the ecosystem because it can actually act as a chemoattractant, as a foraging cue for different um, organisms and predators. So I've added some com com components to this uh, original little schematics. I've added bacteria here and, and zooplankton. Bacteria um, uh, love DMSP, the precursor of DMS, because it is a wonderful source of carbon and sulfur for, for bacteria, uh, especially sulfur because it, um, it's a form uh, of sulfur that's already reduced as opposed to the tons of you know, sulfate there is in the ocean, um, ingesting DMSP uh, is uh, metabolically um, more um, uh, interesting for, for bacteria. And bacteria can do different things with DMSP and we'll see that a little later, but one of the things they do is that they, they incorporate the, the, the carbon and uh, they, uh, the byproduct of that transformation is, is DMS. And when DMS is emitted in the environment, because it smells, it can act as a foraging cue, for example, for zooplankton that will be attracted to the DMS and sends a signal, okay, well, this is an area where there's a hot spot of uh, phytoplankton, so lots of food there. The same, same way, um, uh, it can also attract birds. Uh, you, I'm sure you've already seen you know, birds circling uh, or, or following a, a ship because it's areas of uh, high uh, emission of DMS, signaling an area of hot spot uh, uh, of food for, for these birds. The dark side, however, of the smell of DMS is the fact that uh, nowadays there's a lot of plastics in the ocean and, and plastics can be um, uh, colonized by microorganisms that produce DMS. And so what happens is that this plastic becomes, it, it smells like food and zooplankton uh, will be attracted to microplastics because they smell like food and they will ingest it. In the same way, birds will be attracted, you know, beyond, you know, the colorful aspect of, of um, particles of plastics, there's also the smell associated. It smells like food, and so they, they ingest these particles because they believe it, it is food. So that's kind of the dark side of um, this, this, you know, uh, sweet stink of DMS. Now, let's get into re three reasons why we should care about DMS production in the Arctic more specifically. And I will bring back this graphic from the AR6 IPCC report uh, showing you this, you know, um, tropospheric uh, aerosol indirect effect. Um, and uh, studies show that um, the greatest variance in our uncertainty, so the fact that we have no boxes here, we have no estimates, we just have a sort of like very low level of, of understanding, is actually related to um, natural sources of uh, these uh, aerosols and not ant anthropogenic sources. So results from this uh, study in Nature and, and other studies point to the importance of really understanding uh, processes in pristine pre-industrial-like environments. So with natural, as much as possible, natural aerosols only and free from anthropogenic influence. And it turns out that in the Arctic during summer, and, and I emphasize on, on this word summer because this it's not always the case, but in summer, um, the Arctic atmosphere is relatively clean uh, because there's increased removal of particles from wet scavenging. So basically higher rates of precipitation in warm water and warm weather will wash out uh, sulfates and, and, and particles and aerosols from the atmosphere. Most of the time, however, this is, it can typically look like this. There's, there's a haze associated with the presence of 
of aerosols that can be from anthropogenic um, origin, also natural. But in the summer, conditions uh, um, come together to create an, an atmosphere that is relatively clean. So this uh, allows um, us to understand, by understanding the unpolluted atmosphere, like um, uh, the Arctic atmosphere in summer, it allows us to better understand the impacts of, of pollution and, and climate change. Now, another reason uh, why we turn attention to the Arctic is because it seems to be a hotspot for DMS production, particularly in the productive seasons like, like summer. Uh, until recently, I, I'd say until a decade ago, we, there was a, a paucity uh, of uh, DMS data in the Arctic. Um, and in the last 10 years, um, we've had the, the chance the, uh, to participate in different programs and, and uh, through um, Arctic focused programs and funding, we were able to go several times in the Arctic and measure DMS and measure fluxes um, in the Arctic. And I and and so our team, but also um, other teams um, internationally. Uh, I just I want to focus myself on the Arctic Canadian Arctic domain because that's where I um, uh, I know more of and. Uh, these two graphics show you in different ways uh, concentrations uh, of DMS. So the first one in the middle here uh, shows concentrations at the surface, um, concentrations expressed in animals per liter. Uh, and what we see here is um, we've got some data in uh, Davis Strait, some in, in Baffin Bay, in the archipelago, in, in Fox Basin. And the color scheme goes from um, cool colors, blue, zero um, nanomoles per liter to uh, dark red, which are uh, high concentrations. And you can see that um, there's a lot of variability, spatial uh, variability, but also there's, there's temporal variability in that, um, in that uh, graphic because the, the, the ship is moving in time. Um, and, and to put this into perspective, to put these values into perspective, uh, most of them are higher than the annual global average, which is of uh, three nanomoles per liter. So um, high concentrations of, of DMS in the summertime. This other graphic here shows essentially the same thing from a different campaign, but we're looking here into uh, depth profiles. So we've got concentrations of DMS on the x-axis and the depth there on the y-axis and the, let that little um, gray dotted line represents an average of the mixed layer um, depth and this line represents here a moving average of concentrations of DMS. So again what we see here is a wide range of concentrations but we do see a lot of concentrations which are above three nanomoles per liter in surface waters. So it goes to show that um, the Arctic can be a hotspot during the productive season. And it's important to um, actually take that into account uh, in climatologies, because right now the latest climatology of DMS dates back from 2011. And at that period when that climatology was uh, constructed, um, it really lacked uh, information about what was going on in the Arctic. And a lot of this here is through extrapolation of a very few uh, points, uh, sampling points. And so it's important that uh, eventually all this data, data that we've collected uh, be incorporated uh, into an updated climatology because these DMS climatologies are often used in, in modeling studies uh, to help predict what would happen, um, for example, if um, uh, the earth was warmer or if oceans were more acidic, etc. Right, so the, la the last point uh, I want to make um, in terms of why it's, it's, uh, we, turn atten we like to turn attention to the Arctic uh, is because uh, beyond what is produced into in, in the surface waters, the ice-free waters in terms of DMS, the sea ice itself is a, a nexus of DMS production. And um, there are numerous environments uh, that are associated with sea ice that harbor uh, DMS producing organisms. 
Now, this graphic uh, shows different um, environments associated with the sea ice that uh, can be potential producers uh, of DMS through their harboring of microorganisms that participate in the cycling. It, it could and should actually be updated because uh, we now have more information after this, you know, uh, almost decade of um, getting information uh, through field campaigns. So let's go, let's go through this graphic. Um, the, the numbers in the little boxes refer to maximal concentrations that have been measured in these different um, components of the, of the portrait. So in the ice itself, and I'll show you later, there can be uh, production of DMS or um, concentrations of DMS. But um, at the bottom of the ice is, is a place where DMS concentrations of or, are orders of magnitude higher than the surrounding areas. And this is because um, the bottom of the ice harbors uh, a very rich, uh, in, um, a rich uh, uh, environment for microorganisms that thrive there at the interface. And these organisms produce uh, a DMS. Um, we, we now have information about uh, sub-ice algal mats, these um, filamentous uh, algal, uh, algae that um, attach to the, to the ice that can also be um, vectors for DMS production. Melt ponds, uh, which form at the surface of, of the ice during the melting period, are actually uh, also, um, uh, they harbor microorganisms that produce DMS. And this is an interesting and important part of the story because uh, these melt ponds are in direct contact with the atmosphere at a time where the, uh, uh, the surface of the ocean is covered with ice. So it's an important pathway, a route of uh, transport of, of, of sulfur to the atmosphere when, uh, during a time where, when ice is still present. And so these melt ponds can actually hold more, um, uh, more than uh, that 2.2 that's mentioned here. And I'll show that a little later. Um, now beneath these, these melt ponds, uh, because they act as lenses, uh, they accelerate the melting of the ice at the bottom here. And these domes, the under ice domes can form and we found um, DMS here as well, associated with um, under ice uh, phytoplankton blooms. Now the ice, when it's melting, it cracks, uh, it opens and uh, it can form leads. And these leads uh, can lead to the emission of DMS that's been accumulated under the ice uh, and its emission to the atmosphere. And the edge of the ice, um, the marginal ice zone is, is known to be very uh, productive in terms of, of DMS as well. And later in the season, much like other environments, oceanic environments, uh, there will be formation of a deep chlorophyll maximum. So phytoplankton accumulate near the nitrocline and can also produce DMS um, there. All right, and I wanna show you now um, this is a picture that was taken during one of our, our net care campaigns um, in 2014. And this is where, so we're going out on the ice and we're sampling here these melt ponds. And really this, this speaks volumes of about what the, so if you've never been in the Arctic, so a lot of people think, okay, well, the sea ice, it's, you know, it's consolidated ice, it's, you know, it's thick, it's, it's, you know, it's, but it looks like that during a certain part of its um, annual cycling of melting and freezing. So this is the later part of the, the melting uh, uh, cycle where there's a lot of melt ponds and melt ponds can cover up to 80% of the surface of the ice before it can actually just kind of disintegrate uh, because it's so rotten. So uh, these melt ponds, if all these melt ponds um, harbor DMS producing organisms, they can actually be a very significant vector uh, for the potential emission of DMS towards the atmosphere. Now, another uh, really uh, significant discovery that we've made in our team, and this is work by a uh, former PhD student, Margot Gourdal, is that um, we now know that the sea ice, it, it doesn't necessarily act as a cap 
that prevents fluxes of DMS to the atmosphere. It does at certain moments of, of its cycle, but not, but not always. So we've, we've um, seen, we've measured uh, some fluxes through the ice. And so uh, this graphic shows you uh, the first panel in A are the concentrations in nanomole per liter of DMS in different environments. So bottom ice, uh, interior ice, uh, melt ponds under uh, ice seawater. And we've even measured DMS um, in this sort of slushy uh, snow in between, in between the snow and the, and the ice. So there's, there's DMS kind of everywhere in this, in this system. In panel B, we see the fluxes of DMS in, in micromoles per meter squared per day. And uh, so through different processes, including diff diffusion and, excuse me, bubble rising, DMS can actually uh, be transported upwards um, from the bottom ice to the atmosphere um, when the, the ice is in its melting stages. And the, when, when the snow is sort of cleared out. And we've also measured fluxes uh, from the surface of the sea ice. And of course, well, melt ponds and, and uh, there can be some flux um, from the under ice seawater to the, to, the, um, to the ice. So we see here that prior to the, the melt pond uh, appearing, um, and after uh, snow melting, there's a period where the ice can actually act as a vector of uh, DMS emission by itself. So that's a, um, a really uh, fun uh, discovery that was made um, in our team by um, and uh, presented by Margot Gourdal, who's published this paper in 2019. All right. So, um, I hope I convinced you at this point why uh, I I love DMS and and uh, why I uh, I I still uh, I've been doing this for a long time and I still I still love it. Now um, I would like us to turn our attention to the potential impacts of climate change on DMS, and I'm going to delve into the hot and sour future ocean. And what I mean by that really is you know warmer ocean and an ocean where ocean acidification is taking place. And um, so there's, there's a, a large literature on the subject, um, the impacts of climate change on DMS production. And the reason, the reason being uh, uh, because DMS participates in, uh, in a, to a certain extent in the radiative forcing of our planet. And this is a seminal paper by Kloster et al. in 2007, where, where they looked at the effects, the potential effects of climate warming on DMS production. So they looked uh, at this um, through modeling and uh, the graphic, the picture on the left shows you the sea surface concentrations of DMS in animals per liter. Um, the scale is, you know, the cool colors blue, a, a zero um, goes up to 4.75 um, in the um, warmer colors. And so this, this is the reference period for the model from 1861 to 1890. And the graphic on the right uh, shows the change between this reference period and a future period of 2061 to 2090. And the color scheme is, you know, uh, uh, these blue colors are a negative change, so reduction of DMS, and these warmer colors would be an enhancement of DMS. And the first thing that uh, pops um, on this uh, graphic, of course, is this uh, increase, uh, this very positive increase um, in change in uh, sea surface concentrations of DMS. So in this model, uh, there's an increase in DMS in the Arctic uh, in the future as a result of um, greater primary production uh, due to warmer waters and, and longer ice-free periods. Uh, so that is one um, prediction, that is one uh, prediction of, of models that, um, uh, that, that's out there. And it seems like this, this trend, this, uh, or the, not this trend, but this uh, forecast uh, may be um, 
uh, or at least the, this finding is supported by this uh, a recent study by an ex postdoc from, from our group, Martigali. Um, and he did a study where he looked into uh, different uh, periods of time, the emissions of DMS during different periods of time. And I'll, I'll, I'll do the breakdown of this graphic here. So we have emission by periods. Uh, in black, we have 1998 to 2003. And in purple, um, pinkish, we have 2011 to 2016. For different environments, deep ocean, a shelf area and shelves uh, with high uh, colored detrital ma matter, CDM. And th so this for different latitude bands going from 60 degrees north to 85 degrees north. And what we can see is that for different latitude bands, uh, we have different signals. And so for the 60 to 65, for example, we have a um, a certain reduction in the emission uh, uh, compared to um, the reference period here. And then uh, I won't go through all of them. Basically, this is what the panel B shows and uh, draw your attention to the red circles, which is the relative trend in percentage of change per decade. And uh, so it seems like the lower latitude, so below 70 degrees north, there's not much change in the relative trend in DMS emissions. But when uh, we look at 70 north and above, there seems to be an increasing trend in DMS emissions um, in the Arctic. So um, it seems like these findings support um, the paper by Kloster suggesting uh, increased DMS in DMS emissions uh, in the Arctic. Now, um, a, second, um, a second look into the impacts of a warmer Arctic on the production of DMS stems from several, uh, several Arctic campaigns um, that we conducted over the years. Um, and we collected observations, collected measurements, and um, so beyond, like most of us know that, you know, the, the, the extent of the ice cover is now shrinking, has been shrinking, uh, but there's also the replacement of, uh, more and more replacement of the multi-year uh, multi sea ice and a great, greater prevalence of the first year uh, sea ice. And this has consequences, potential consequences for DMS production. And um, so, because there's uh, le the, the, the ice is less thick, there's an increase uh, in light penetration through the ice. And that favors the development of bottom ice uh, biomass here. So, so the, the graphic here shows multi-year uh, ice, uh, which tends to reflect more incoming solar radiation with uh, uh, part um, absorption of uh, sort uh, radiation. And this is uh, the first, uh, first uh, year sea ice with presence of melt ponds. And you can see that there is some reflection, of course, of, of the um, incoming solar radiation, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of or more incoming solar radiation can be um, absorbed and uh, go through the ice. And this favors the development of uh, microorganisms that can potentially produce DMS. So, there's a greater footprint of DMS stocks prior to the actual ice melt in a, in a world where there would only be first year uh, sea ice in the Arctic. Uh, the increase in this, uh, the, the increase in the permeability of the sea ice, um, also, as I mentioned before, the work by Margot Gourdal, uh, could um, aid in the upward transport of DMS from the bottom of the ice at a time where there's not um, the extent of the melt ponds are not it's not very um, vast and uh, but while the ice is still present on, on the top of the um, uh, the ocean so this is um, a pathway uh, for which DMS can ventilate into the atmosphere. Uh, even though the, the ice is still present. 
Now, an increase in the surface of melt pond coverage uh, could potentially also lead to um, increased emissions of DMS if these melt ponds are colonized by DMS producing um, microorganisms. And another aspect of this changing, you know, from multi, uh, multi year uh, sea ice to first year sea ice is um, the earlier seasonal ice uh, melt which could potentially lead to um, changes in the phenology of the, this uh, cyclicity of the blooms and development of phytoplankton and their potential production of DMS. So altogether, these um, different processes that are changing uh, would point towards um, increased DMS uh, production from these environments in a warmer future, in a warmer Arctic. Now, if we turn our attention to the sour part of, of uh, the impacts of climate change, and I'm refer uh, referencing here ocean acidification, there have been several studies looking into the impact of ocean acidification on the production of DMS. And um, as many things <laughs> that we study, it's, it's quite complex because DMS production um, is not straightforward and it um, entails the active participation of, of many actors and uh, there are different there are many processes in the cycling but this table uh, from a paper uh, published by one of our students Rachel Luchard shows uh, kind of like a synthesis of um, maybe not all but many of the uh, ocean acidification experiments that have been conducted both microcosms and, and mesocosms and so we, we see here the different locations where the experiments were conducted, the uh, change in pH that was, um, that was um, uh, done uh, through a, a range of uh, PCO2 here. For, so of course it's difficult to compare between all these different uh, um, experiments because they don't, they're from different environments. They, they, they didn't look at exactly the, the same PCO2 range, et cetera, et cetera. But what we can um, definitely see from this table is that most, the majority of the experiments have shown a, a decrease, a weakening of DMS under ocean acid, acidification. Some studies have shown no change while uh, a few studies have shown act an actual uh, increase in the DMS production. But overall, there seems to be uh, uh, a weakening uh, in the response uh, uh, of DMS to ocean acidification. Now, uh, the weakening of this production of DMS in many studies has been related to the fate of DMSP consumed by bacteria. And until recently, um, no one had really, so this was suggested in, in several papers as a, you know, a discussion and as a, a way forward, but uh, until recently, no one had really looked into the, um, the actual routing of DMSP that's consumed by bacteria. Um, and so this is something that, um, okay, so, I have to mention here that, um, as I said before, the, the DMS cycling is, is quite complex. And um, this part, uh, I, I mentioned before that bacteria can, can uh, produce DMS, but they, they can actually also use DMSP, which they consume in a different way. And this is called the microbial switch which really, and this graphic is quite complex and I won't go into the details with you, don't focus on the different compounds, just focus on these two uh, pathways. There's the cleavage pathway. So DMSP is consumed by bacteria and then it can be cleaved. And one of the byproducts is DMS, which can potentially ventilate if it's not consumed or, or destroyed by photooxidation or it can eventually ventilate into the atmosphere. The other pathway is called a demeth demethylation pathway and this doesn't produce DMS. So, and we think that uh, the percentage of DMSP converted to DMS, the DMS yield, um, is related to the DMSP that's uh, available in the environment and the sulfur requirements of the bacteria. So for example, if we had very little DMSP in the environment 
and very high sulfur demand from bacteria, we'd have very little DMSP converted to DMS. But let's say at some point, bacteria fulfill their requirements in sulfur uh, in an environment where there's a lot of uh, DMSP, then they can you know, start using DMSP for something else. And then uh, the percentage of DMSP converted to DMS will be high. Now, um, so what we did is that we looked into, and this is a paper by Robin Benard, one of our uh, ex-PhD students that's uh, in press right now, um, coming out shortly, hopefully. Um, so we, we tracked the routing of DMSP. So we use um, radioisotope, so S35 uh, labeled DMSP, and we follow what happens. We feed this to, uh, to the bacteria and we follow what happens. And uh, so this is a study where we use two different, uh, th oh, sorry, three, um, well, two targets of PCO2. So one PCO2 is the, the in-situ uh, PCO2 in the environment, and then two and three uh, times the, the initial PCO2. And we looked into the yield of DMS, so the percentage of DMSP consumed by bacteria that's transformed into DMS. And we see a significant decrease of this yield at the high level uh, PCO2. And then uh, we wanted to, to, to go for, and this kind of um, uh, agrees with all the, the literature um, um, propose, um, proposing that um, the weakening of DMS is related to the, the different routing of uh, DMSP by bacteria. And we also looked into what happens with the sulfur when the bacteria eat DMSP, and this is uh, can be expressed as a the incorporation efficiency of, of sulfur into the macromolecules of, of um, these bacteria, and uh, we see uh, we see a decrease as well in this um, uh, in the uh, two and three times PCO two, and um, I didn't I don't show it here, but. Uh, the conclusion of, of this paper is that um, the bacteria actually uptake the DMSP like a luxury item to protect themselves from the stress of the, um, the higher acidified environment. But I won't go into the detail of that because that's kind of more, um, well, yeah, it's more details there. Uh, but I invite you to read the paper when it comes out, if you're interested. Now, of course, um, you know, you, we can look at different stressors um, individually, but it's always useful to kind of look at, at several stressors together to see if there's any, you know, synergistical or uh, synergistic or antagonistic um, or additive effects. And this is what we did in this paper. Uh, and the, the results, are, this is not, um, from Arctic waters. This is um, results from a mesocosm experiment conducted with waters from the St. Lawrence estuary. And uh, what we have here is um, in the blue, these are all the mesocosms that um, were at in-situ temperature, which is 10 degrees here. And in red, the mesocosms that were um, that we increased in temperature. So a five degree increase in temperatures to 15. And then we have the different mesocosm had a different uh, PCO2, PCO2 target. And what we can see from here uh, on the uh, y-axis is the DMS concentration and the different PCO2 scenarios in the different mesocosms. And we can see in both cases, there's a uh, weakening of the DMS production uh, as we increase the PCO2. But what's interesting here is that when we increase uh, the temperature by five degrees, we actually increase the DMS. So a five degree, it still goes down with the PCO2, but we initially kind of create a, a boost. So a five degree warming uh, increased DMS concentration by an average of two, uh, 240% as compared to the in-situ temperature here. Uh, which resulted in a you know, positive effect offset of the adverse PC2 impact. So, and, and in this study, uh, we found some um, correlations between uh, the, the concentrations of DMS and uh, the bacterial production, which again points towards um, a temperature associated enhancement of the bacterial metabolism of DMSB, as I mentioned. Um, just uh, right before. 
So uh, this could be an important driver of the mitigating effect of warming on the negative impact of acidification on the net production of DMS. So this is something that we, we need to, to learn more about. And this brings me to the last three points of this talk, which are the ways forward. Uh, where should we focus our attention um, to have a better handle of these different, um, of the dynamics involved in DMS production? Well, the first one uh, would be, of course, to look into multiple stressors. So I've mentioned warming and ocean acidification in certain you know, areas of the planet, the ocean could be deoxygenation. So these um, uh, experiments are, are very useful, but they're very complex. And so um, it's, always, it's always kind of challenging to, uh, to do these experiments, but, but they are needed. Another, um, another key focus would be the microbial routing of DMSB and the degradation of DMS, because eventually uh, this is where uh, it's, it's like it, it will determine the amount of DMS that can potentially diffuse into the atmosphere and potentially impact radiative forcing. So opening this black box is, is we've started to do, to, to do that, but we need to really dig deeper into this box and, and try to figure out um, the different routing of DMSB and how it's affected by, for example, different agents of climate change. And another key component, of course, is atmospheric chemistry and the modeling of clouds. This is a key component uh, and one that's very complex. And uh, I've, as I've shown in the IPCC uh, graph there, it's related to a lot of uncertainty. And one of the reasons why it's so uncertain uh, is this very simple figure here from, from NASA uh, for kids. Uh, that illustrates well one of the complexities associated with cloud uh, and their impact of radiative forcing. Some clouds, low level warm clouds, tend to increase um, the albedo uh, of our planet. So they tend to have a net cooling effect. But higher clouds, the cold clouds uh, in the higher atmosphere, um, tend to have a blanket effect. So they will, uh, whoops, they will um, reflect. Uh, uh, the uh, heat radiation back, back to Earth. So um, right now, the net effect of these different clouds on, on radiative forcing is a net cooling. But uh, uh, what will happen in, in a you know, warmer, um, warmer future is still, still uncertain. So it's important to uh, try to decipher under, and understand um, this aspect of uh, atmospheric chemistry and the modeling of clouds. On that, uh, I want to thank um, the, the funding agencies for uh, providing support to make all these um, uh, field campaigns possible and, and a collection of data and, and publishing of papers. And I want to also take this opportunity to do a little publicity. Um, I am the national representative of SOLAS in Canada. And so if you have any uh, you know, Sol SOLAS related um, research that you'd like to highlight, uh, please don't hesitate to contact me. I would be very uh, glad to uh, help you highlight that. Highlight that. Uh, we have a newsletter in which uh, we can publish um, uh, research highlights. And um, so thank you for, for your attention. Thank you for listening. Great. Thank you so much. That was a, a great talk. Um, now we have some time for questions. Um, Feel free to uh, you know, put your video on and unmute yourself uh, if you have a question. Can I just yes. ask? Um, thank you. Yes, that was very, very enjoyable. Um, you were talking about the, the um, increase of DMS production in the Arctic and giving different reasons, um, one of them being more phytoplankton production. But um, from what I vaguely remember is there's also a big difference in which type of phytoplankton produced the DMS efficiently. So can you say something about the role of shifts in community composition in that respect? Absolutely. So um, DMSP, uh, as you mentioned, Uta, is a very uh, 
different. Uh, the biosynthesis is very different between different uh, groups, uh, algal groups. For example, um, uh, dinoflagellates, certain dinoflagellates, or uh, phaeocystis, uh, primnesiophytes are, are known to be strong producers. Diatoms uh, are known to vary in their uh, biosynthesis of, of DMSP. Some produce very little, some can produce more. In the Arctic environment, they're thought to produce more as um, uh, a way to protect themselves uh, from, from freezing temperatures. So the production of DMSP uh, um, by phytoplankton in the Arctic could be um, viewed as a cryoprotectant. Um, in other parts of the world, the MSP can, it's an, it can act as an osmoregulator, regulator, or it can also be um, uh, help to counteract uh, antioxidants. So it has a, a wide range of uh, physio physiological functions. So um, yeah, indeed, if, if the phenology of these blooms change uh, as, a, as a function of, you know, uh, earlier seasonal uh, sea ice melt. And um, um, we, we're also seeing um, a sort of Atlantification of certain areas of the Arctic, for example, um, in, um, in Baffin Bay, um, in Labrador Sea, we're seeing um, species, for example, Phaeocystis that we had never seen there before. And so, Phaeocystis being a, um, a very strong DMSP producer and uh, DMS, uh, this could have a strong impact on the overall like footprint of, of DMS uh, in the Arctic. Thank you. You're welcome. Do we have any other questions or, or comments? Um, on Facebook, yeah, I'll check on Facebook. Um, so if there's no other question, maybe I can ask a second one. Sure, and go ahead, Uta. <laughs> on the South Pole. They seem to have been in your map, if I saw that right, they seem to predict um, not an increase, but a decrease in DMSP production or DMS production. From so, the, the cluster uh, uh, paper, you mean, in a, a warmer ocean? A yeah, warmer? Okay. yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, I, I haven't, I have to admit, I haven't read that paper in a long time. And I, I, I admit also that I, I had been focusing more on the Arctic, but um, if I had to guess, uh, I would think that it could be related to um, uh, slowing down perhaps of thermal haline circulation uh, in a warmer, uh, warmer world. So, you know, if, um, and this is the guess, but, and then that would potentially lead to less nutrients and a more stratified ocean, less primary production, but I, I have to admit, I have to read that paper again. It's been a while, but that would be my guess. Yeah. That would do it suddenly, yes. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. So, so I have a, a, a couple of, I guess, more general questions. But first of all, very nice presentation, very well. Uh, I thought you, you covered the material sort of from the basics to, to what you're doing and, and gave a very broad uh, outlook there. One of the things that, we all get caught up in when we look at um, making predictions is that we assume that uh, whatever species we're looking at, you talked about changes of species, but whatever species we're looking at remains static and we'll choose two very different uh, pHs or temperatures. And we'll say, okay, oh my God, this is what's gonna happen in the future. Um, so how do you deal with, with you know, natural adaptation uh, in these kind of models? Yeah, that's an excellent question, and, and one that uh, can't we can't resolve with these experiments, these microcosm and mesocosms, because there there's no adaptation phase, right? We just stress them out, basically. So they they are informative, especially when um, when the communities are resilient. You know, when when there is a negative impact. Okay, well, you can say well, there's a negative impact, but is it due to the fact that we're just like totally stressing them out? So when they're actually resilient, there's no change. 
then we can say, well, okay, you know, we, we shock the, you know, we shock them with a, a strong treatment and they, they're, they're resilient and they're, they're still thriving. Um, and so, yeah, that aspect, uh, well, it's difficult to, it's, it's really difficult to decipher the adaptation part of it. Um, but definitely, you know, ocean acidification is not, you know, happening the way we, we do it in these microcosm and mesocosm experiments. So I would say that, yeah, it's definitely more informative when um, the, the organisms are resilient than when they, they don't fare well. But it's still, it gives us an indication. And some, some species, for example, coccolithophores don't fare very well. Um, for example, when, when we acidify, uh, because they're made of uh, calcareous uh, liths, um, which are very sensitive to, to pH. But um, yeah, it's, it's a good question. It's, it's really difficult to, to answer. But definitely there, there will be adaptation and perhaps uh, replacement of certain species that can't uh, adapt very well by others that, that uh, are more, um, have a wider tolerance. And what's interesting in the Arctic, there's a recent paper out by Frances Hopkins. And uh, she showed that in different uh, Arctic environments, actually, um, this is a, a, an experiment with social acidification that um, the, the communities are quite resilient because to, to the different PCO2 treatments because they are already sort of adapted to an environment that has high fluctuations of PCO2 because, you know, as you know, the, the sea ice, the, uh, the Arctic receives a lot of fresh water in, in flux, uh, which, you know, um, makes the a pH very strongly. So um, there, there is some literature out there showing that um, some, some Arctic communities are, are quite resilient already. To the right. So this is something we, we all have to deal with is, is sort of how, how reliable are our predictions. And one of the things you showed, which we all come across as well, is you showed a, a table where you looked at the effect of acidification and there were all these small negatives and then there was one or a couple of papers that were positive and one was hugely positive. And so uh, have you managed to rationalize why those are different? Um, I'd have to go back to read specifically all these um, in that paper specifically. Uh, it can be related to, uh, you know, at the base, like if there's a big bloom of a specific um, phytoplankton that's high uh, producer of DMS, uh, which can, you know, lead to the accumulation of DMS. Uh, it, it, it can be related to, to, to a number of things, but I'd have to go back to read. Um, I can't quite remember uh, that huge increase, what it was, um, how they explained that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Hi, would it be all right if I asked a quick question? Sure, go ahead, Robin. It's almost at four, but this can be our last question. Okay, Thank sorry about that. Uh, thanks so much. Uh, thank you for this very, very nice talk. Um, and uh, I, I'm, I'm working in the field of fish physiology, so it's, it's quite a bit different things that I, that I uh, work on. But I was wondering, since that in the Arctic, DMS production is relatively high, um, is there anything known about how this compound affects um, fish in that environment or how they play in in this really complex uh, cycle that DMS goes through? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know much about fish. Uh, uh, the only like the only link I can think of between DMS and, and fish is the blackberry feed. Um, this is something that uh, my advisor, Maurice Levassar, worked on early on uh, in his career where uh, fish had this stinky, stinky smell uh, related to the ingestion of um, DMS-containing uh, zooplankton, 
the DMSP containing zooplankton and um, breakdown of the DMSP uh, in the gut and, and uh, the, yeah, the, the emission of DMS within, within the fish. But yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. It's, it's uh, yeah, it, it'd be interesting to, uh, to, to try to see uh, other connections. Yeah, I know that in the bigger climatic picture that fish don't play a very major role, but um, when you look at diagrams, you talk about uh, phytoplankton, zooplankton, but I was wondering how like the higher tropic levels are playing in. Um, um, and I, I, I quickly Googled DMS in fish. <laughs> um, and it does seem like there are some effects on fish as well, but um, in terms of a new topic to read more about for me. Yeah, yeah. Another branch of the, the DMS research. Uh, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, well, thanks again for such a great seminar. I think that was a really great, uh, some really good questions. So uh, thank you for joining us. Um, and thanks to everybody who uh, came today for the, the talk. So um, next week, uh, yeah, next week we have another seminar for anybody who wants to join. Um, and we'll be sending out a reminder and posters about that like we, we normally do at the beginning of next week. So uh, have a great day, everyone. And thank you again uh, for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.